As uh, most of you know, my name is King, and I started this class last year. But this semester, McKinsey has taken the reins and done a fabulous job. So I need your help in just a minute. I brought her some flowers to so thank her for the amazing job she's done. And I'm uh, yeah. you. Planning the classes is not easy, and I think she's done famously. So if you could give her another round of applause. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to teach this class if it wasn't for you. Um, I took this class freshman year, and then um, when King had um, other things to do, then I just took it over. So um, you started it, and it's an awesome class. So I'm just happy to be a part of it. This class will be offered again next semester. If you're going to be around, please uh, sign up again if you're interested in the subject. Brand new speakers every, uh, every semester, and I know Mackenzie does a great job with that. Along with that, there's another class that I mentioned last uh, week that uh, I'll be teaching called Storytelling for Entrepreneurship. So if you're looking for another decal, um, please do consider that. That class is all about public speaking skills, how to tell your story, how to get your vision across to people. So if that's something that you're interested in, please do consider that. But uh, I didn't want to take away too much time from you, and I didn't want to cut at the end, so uh, I hope you don't mind that I did this in the beginning. Not at all. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, today we have Raj Sudhata. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Bloom Reach. Um, and before that, um, he was an entrepreneur in residence at Moore David Dow Ventures. Um, before that, he was the director of product marketing at Cisco. Um, he's done like a lot of really awesome things, <coughs> got his MBA at Harvard Business School, um, really great speaker. We're really excited to have him for our last class, so if we can help welcome him. Thank you. So it's awesome to be uh, introduced here. Fired up that there is even a college class that talks about entrepreneurship. There was there was barely a business school class on entrepreneurship when I was when I was at HBS, and there certainly wasn't any kind of undergrad class that was related to, to entrepreneurship at all. You know, in college, which is now many eons ago. But uh, excited to tell you uh, all about my journey. But you know, hopefully keep this pretty interactive. Talk about anything that's on your mind. I mean, a whole range of topics you know that are relevant to entrepreneurship. It sounds like the one that. We'll talk a little bit about his failures and how how to, how to overcome those failures, what comes of those failures, what lessons have been learned from that. Uh, but a whole range of topics. I've uh, you know one of the topics that Mackenzie was mentioning was fundraising. I'm just completing my eighth fundraising process in my life for various companies, so I've been through that journey several times. I've been through three different startups. This is my third startup. I've been through all kinds of team building exercises. You know, over the course of time, I've been through technical. Technical undertakings. I've been through more business-oriented uh, startups over the years. I've been an investor, um, a seed investor, through a fund called Founder Collective. So, whole range of experiences, and, and happy to share any of those stories. And I'm looking forward to hearing your stories and what kinds of things both you guys have done, want to do, and, and um, think you might aspire to do. You know, one day. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background on what I've been up to, and then we'll talk about a couple of different stories, and then dive in, you know, into areas that are interesting to you guys. So I. Um, uh, my, I, I've done really three core startups over the course of my life, uh, and the first one was I was very much an accidental entrepreneur. I finished um, college, and I was an electrical engineer, and I was, uh, re I was doing research at a lab on the East Coast called Bell Labs, which no longer exists anymore, but happened to invent the telephone. And, uh, and then from there, I, I spent two years on Wall Street, and um, I was working there, you know, my, I was about to go to business school, my boss was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about starting this, this internet venture, telecom venture over in Europe, and I was like, well, I'm going to go back to school, I'm not sure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do this, and he sort of roped me in in the last five or six months when I was kind of hanging out before going to business school, actually. And I um, ended up getting involved in that venture, and that venture was about building broadband, you know, so in the late 1990s, there was no broadband, there was dial-up, and so people were putting fiber optic cable in the ground, People were putting wireless cables up to basically construct high-speed networks. And that had started in the U.S. maybe two years before, and, but it hadn't happened in the rest of the world. And so the idea was, let's just go make that happen in the rest of the world. It was a pretty simple idea. Make, create high-speed internet access for everybody. And so, you know, I was uh, hanging out in New York. Um, again, did not have any intention of actually doing it full-time. Had accepted admission to go to business school uh, at that point. And 
you know, um, there were three of us involved in starting the venture, and two of them lived in New York, had families. They were like, hey, you know, the venture looks like it's going to be in Europe. Would you mind going to Europe for a little while? So I picked, I picked up. I had never been to Europe. I got on the, phone, on the plane. I moved to Paris. I actually moved to Paris because I thought the women would be hotter in Paris than elsewhere. So I moved to Paris. I set up the venture in Paris. And then on day one, you know, I tried to set up a bank account for the company. And so I went to the bank. And, and the person at the bank was like, yeah, you know, first of all, I didn't speak French. But they were like, basically, I understood you needed a um, cell phone number to get a bank account. So I was like, okay, I'll go to the cell phone shop. So I went to the cell phone shop. And they were like, you really need a residence in Paris to get a cell phone. Okay. So then I went to uh, try to rent an apartment. And they were like, you really need a bank account in Paris <laughs> you know, to, uh, to rent an apartment. And I was like... I'm getting on the train, I'm going to London. So, <laughs> so I went to London, set up that company in London. It was a crazy ride, which I'll tell you about. Plenty of failures in that, in that, in that venture, but um, ultimately that became a real company. About 600 people in the business. We built high-speed networks across 10 countries in Europe, and we basically sold internet access. Um, and I raised a billion dollars of capital during that time. I was 23 years old. Uh, it was um, insane. There were all kinds of ups and downs, you know, during that during that period of time. And then we hit, you know, 2001, which was uh, a really down time, and there was no money, and the world was falling apart. Eventually, we sold that business to a U.S.-based internet service provider, which later went bankrupt. But uh, it was sort of one of these stories where, I guess, the way I would describe it is: one year earlier, it would have been amazing. Uh, one year later, it would have been a total disaster. But we were able to do all right. And I came back to the U.S. after that, and, and that's how I came to business school. So came back to business school, came out to the Valley you know, very shortly thereafter. And actually, the way I got into kind of my second startup was I wrote a paper about disruption in the networking industry with one of my professors at that time, Clay Christensen. Uh, and he, he uh, there was this whole idea about disruptive innovation. I wrote that paper. That paper happened to be read by the CEO of Cisco. And he was like, well, we, you know, this is a paper about how this kid is going to disrupt Cisco. So why don't, we, why don't we offer him a deal? And I, I was working on a startup to do that here in the Valley. And he offered me a deal to roll that up into Cisco. And that's how I ended up in Cisco. And that's how I ended up you know, over there for a couple of years. And I built uh, a business over at Cisco for a couple of years. It was there. Um, it was awesome in the beginning, horrible after a little while, because it just was too big. So I left again, hung out, you know, and, and um, spent what I, would just, what I would call my two years in the wilderness, where basically I had a kid. You know, uh, we had a mortgage in Silicon Valley, very expensive place to live, and I was like hanging out trying to start companies, and went through probably eight or nine different ideas. Most of them didn't work. Uh, ended up starting a venture that today is Bloomreach, and and, um, and it's gone great. Uh, if, you know, 250 people in a nutshell. What Bloomreach does is power every website and app that's out there and make it dynamic and personalized for each of you, so that. What you see if you go to Nordstrom.com or if you were shopping this weekend, you know, is different than what I see, and, and our preferences are reflected. And in effect, we create a kind of dynamic experience for each individual who visits a website or uses an app. And that business has, has, has gone great. Uh, I've been at it now five or six years, and, and I'm hoping to turn it into a, a really large company. So that's my story in a nutshell. So in, you know, in, in all of that, I would say you know, a couple of things Everybody's entrepreneurial journey is a little different, right? And, and along the way, at least for me personally, I've had plenty of failures. Um, the first one, you know, was in that telecom startup where it was just, you know, completely insane. We went through periods of time where, um, you know, we were, we were bidding for licenses from governments to get spectrum. We had all kinds of governments turn us down. So we basically had tens of millions of dollars sunk into infrastructure with no license to operate the service from the government. Negotiating with like the government of Ireland. I remember one one story around that time. West Germany and East Germany were unifying, and so they basically were like, "Okay, you can operate your network in Germany, which is the biggest market in Europe, if you promise to build a lot of blind schools for the blind." And I was like, "That sounds awesome, except we're a telecom company. We don't really have anything to do with schools for the blind." But we did. Uh, but we went through periods of time where we were just burning cash and not, you know, not really operating a service uh, and not making any money. In the process, that was crazy. We went through periods of time when the networks were down, and you know we had millions of customers, you know that were sort of out there. And then probably the, the biggest challenge that that business had was in 2001 when 
just like money dry, you know, dried up. And this was a business where you were literally putting fiber optic cable in the ground, having construction workers take out you know, things and, and put them in, in the ground and build wireless towers. And so when you run out of money in that kind of a business with 600 people that work for you, it sucks. Um, and by the way, you can't fire anyone in Europe because of the way labor laws work over there. So it was crazy. But you know, we kind of, I would say, through that experience, <coughs> Maybe the number one takeaway I had from all those down times was I was at that time, you know, pretty young and not very experienced. In fact, not experienced at all. And there were people around me who were extremely experienced. You know, had they were they were they were veterans of many different businesses. And mostly, what I would do, you know, when we were thinking about what to do, whether to spend money on on this or offer this service or open this market, is you know, I'd have a point of view on it, but I would mostly trust the judgment of other people, sort of being like, they got to know what they're doing and I probably don't know what I'm doing. And it turned out they actually didn't know what they were doing either. It's not that I knew what I was doing, but they didn't really know what they were doing either. And so, you know, I think what I took away most from that early experience is by the good fortune of being involved in a startup early, which had plenty of ups and downs that I would not call ultimately a success, I, I, I took away number one that, the, that, that entrepreneurship was awesome. And that, just, just going through that three year period, I would say I sort of probably gained 15 years of business experience in three years. And it gave me the confidence to say, I can do this. Like, maybe I'll make mistakes, maybe I'll do it right, but I'm not gonna be any worse than the next guy. And it, it gave me the confidence to sort of have uh, in myself to be able to go take that risk. And then it gave me the clarity to then spend the rest of my life building stuff and not be distracted by recruiters who come to universities and friends who make a lot of money and and uh, other, other potential jobs. Because, especially for all of you who are here, it's, it's walking away from the other things that are sure things and doing this that is the harder choice. Because so many entrepreneurs around the world are entrepreneurs by lack of choice. They don't, they're not, they don't have marketable skills to do anything else. And, but all of you in this room have those skills. And so the hard choice is to, to not use those skills to go do things that are to be gainfully employed and actually do it. Right? So, the fact that I could, I could walk away with that clarity at such an early age meant that I didn't have to waste time like interviewing at McKinsey. You know, and and that, that was awesome. Uh, you know, I just didn't have to worry about it. And I felt very secure about the path that I was on because of that early experience. The, um, you know, with, this, with this business, there have been, you know, there have been plenty, of, plenty of ups and downs. There, um, or actually, I should, I should say, even before this business, there was a period from 2000 six to 2008 when I had left Cisco and I was involved in starting companies and I really literally went from venture to venture to venture and something was always wrong. And it was, you know, the team was wrong, the market was wrong, the product was wrong, the business was wrong, the forces at work were wrong. There was even one venture that I tried to start that was basically about building a kind of a competitor to what is today Amazon Web Services. And, um, and I tried to raise money for that and I talked to probably 40 firms and on Sand Hill Road and failed, it just did not work. And in retrospect, it was like the best thing that ever happened to me because if I had started that business, that business, I would have spent five years of my life and then failed, which, which would have been a lot worse than knowing that up front and you know, kind of walking away from it. And in fact, a decision that I made you know, around that time, which was crazy, was I finally got somebody to give me like $250,000. And this is <laughs> 2008 when there was absolutely no money for anything. It's amazing, by the way, how fundraising environments are highly volatile. And I got that money and then ultimately decided this business wasn't going to work. And I returned the money and said, look, keep it. Let's not go burn your money and my, my time you know, building this business. And the credibility that that gave me every step thereafter, which is like, this is a guy who is thoughtful enough to use our money wisely and make a choice that is often pretty difficult for an entrepreneur, gave me credibility downstream. And it got me into the business that I'm in today, which just structurally is a far better business, a better market, and a better idea, and a better team than any of those earlier you know, kind, of, uh, kind of things you know, were. And the final, you know, final story I'll tell you about you know, kind of failure is on this, on this specific venture, um, you know, we started in 2009. The business went, you know, did extremely well. There was about three years of unbelievable growth. And without getting into the specifics, around 2012, we hit a specific issue that basically meant there was a chance the company could, company could go completely under. And this was after you know, we had about 100 people in the business. We had 
about $15 million of revenue in the business at that point. So you wouldn't think a business at that size would go away. But it was enough of a macro issue that that, that could have happened. And I remember the calls I made to the three investors, and I just said, look, this could just completely go away. And what we did at that time, which I think is very important you know, in situations of failure, is to look the facts in the eye and not, not look at them through rose-tinted glasses. Just simply look at them and say, under this situation, you know, path A, 100% failure. Path B, you know, 20% chance of success. Path C, it's going to take A, B, C. It's going to be really difficult. We're going to have to make this choice and that choice and go in this direction and kill that product and go over here. But we have, you know, it's the only scenario that leads to a successful outcome. And by looking at the facts so directly in the face, which believe it or not, so many entrepreneurs don't do, we were able to make clear-headed choices that today, three, you know, three years later, make the business extraordinarily successful. But it was a, it's a tough thing to look reality in the face when you mostly spend your, your time prior to that drinking your own cooling. And, and so you have a hard time kind of reconciling with that and acting on it in a way that is productive. Uh, and I think we did that, and, and it helped. So I, I take away you know, maybe two or three big things about these kind of cases of failure. One is, you know, from, from sort of the earlier venture, you know, trust your own judgment, trust your own gut. In the end, to the extent that you're doing anything entrepreneurial, nothing else is going to matter anyway, so you may as well trust it. Uh, figure out how to fail. Uh, don't be afraid of failing early. Failing early is almost the best thing that can happen to you, and it's often <coughs> downstream leads to really good things that occur out of that. You know, out of almost every one of those failures, I can point to something amazing <laughs> that happened later because that failure you know, occurred. And so don't be afraid of that. Just when the moment is there, the moment is all encompassing and it, it feels terrible, remember that there is, you know, like, every, like every, around the corner of every, of every failure is something amazing that can happen and usually does if you have the right you know, kind of perspective. Third thing is, is persistence, you know, and uh, this you'll hear from every entrepreneur, it is 90% about effort. And in those periods of time of, at least for me, with two and a half years, if I knew that it was going to take two and a half years to start another company, I'm not sure I would have done it. But what I would do is I would work on venture number one, and I'd try it out, and something would go wrong, and I'd be like, well, the next one's going to work. It's going to work out in like three months. And I would do that, and then, and then you know, that one wouldn't work out, and I'd go to the next one. And somewhere in the middle, I just check out and make sure I was still employable, get a job, turn it down, and get back to it. And then that would give me the confidence to then keep going. Because I, I always looked at it like, hey, what's the worst thing that can happen? I can go get a job like everybody else. And so if your downside case is as good as everybody else's existing case, then why wouldn't you go do it? I mean, there's just not that much downside. And that's a helpful way of looking at the world as well, in those moments of extraordinary failure or extraordinary, where it needs a lot of persistence. Remember that for most of us here, we're not going to starve. We're going to be okay. So it's not that bad. What is the worst thing that, what is the worst thing that could happen you know, uh, if your venture fails tomorrow? It's not that bad in the, in the grand scheme of things. So you know, the persistence piece, very important. Very important to stay true to it. Very important. A lot of people give up you know, in those moments. And, go work at Google for five years and wish they left Google four years earlier. You know, and that's the usual. So I get, I get this call from friends all the time. Hey, you know, I'm uh, thinking about leaving big company X. Pick your, pick your big company. You know, I don't like it here. And you know, I'm thinking about starting a company. And, and I usually have just one question for them, which is like, have you quit yet? And they're usually like, no, I'm thinking about it. And then I'm like, call me when you quit. Yeah. Because there's just too many people who are, who are uh, who talk about entrepreneurship, but don't do it. And I don't have respect for those people. I don't think that that's a, I don't think that's a valid way of aspiring to it. That's like me being like, yeah, you know, I mean, I ran, I, I ran on the treadmill over the weekend, and, you know, hey, I'm thinking about being in the NFL. What do you think? You know, I mean, that's a little bit what it sounds like to me, you know, on the other side. So I'm like, you know, you, you really do have to ultimately put your money where your mouth is and go do it and be willing to fail and go, go, um, Go try to make that happen, but you know, important to um, uh, you know have the persistence to work through you know those those kinds of situations and be able to communicate that to your team. That is ultimately a big part of, of what it takes to, to be successful. You know, and the last one is is this point about about kind of looking the facts in the eye and always you always have choices. 
So the decisions are not about like dwelling on the failure or dwelling, dwelling on something that went wrong. It's all, always about charting what the available options are, many of which suck as options, but that's okay. There are options. So your only, your only choice is to choose between a set of options. And you make that choice, you commit to that choice, and, and, and you kind of you know, go at it. It is a, um, the hardest thing about failing and succeeding in entrepreneurship as a whole that you, know, you should be aware of is that it comes with enormous sacrifice. And anybody that tells you otherwise just isn't, isn't telling you the truth about it. You know, I mean, it's just, it comes with enormous sacrifice. It comes with enormous personal sacrifice. It comes with some financial sacrifice, but frankly, that's actually on the lowest end of the list of the sacrifices you make. It comes with enormous sacrifice with mental health and stress, and it is, it's like where other things are over here, it's like over here in terms of degree of difficulty. And you guys all know the probabilities of success. So make sure you're the kind of person for whom that's okay. Don't do it because it's a cool thing to do. You know, don't do it because it's what a lot of your friends do or it's what a lot of people around you do. Be true to yourself. Um, maybe give it a shot early so that you know what's involved. And then embrace it, you know, kind of wholeheartedly and, and it will give back to you as much as you will give it. You know, whether you succeed or fail. Ultimately. So it's been, it is, um, what, I, what I can tell you guys is, it has been the best choice I've, I've made, you know, throughout my life. Different forms of entrepreneurship. Success, success or failure. Success is a lot more fun, without question. But in the end, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a great choice. It, it's, it's one that pays off downstream in ways that are, are much more deep than what it used to be. So let me stop there. Um, any topics or questions related to what I've talked about? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned persistence. And uh, I'm just wondering, <coughs> like, how do you differentiate pers uh, between persistence and simply a bad idea? Yeah. Because when it's a great point. If you have like a bad idea and you, well, but you, you're not really sure because you're like new and you're just new to the market, yeah. so you don't really know if it's just a bad idea or it's just you need a little bit of push you to, need be able more to time. get it. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's one that the <coughs> glib answer is you know, you just have to believe. But the truth is, most entrepreneurs, if you really dig in, especially you know, over a couple of drinks, will tell you all their, all their deepest fears about the business they're building, right? And so here's one approach that I, that I have always taken. I, I've started three businesses in three very different areas, right? Like one was telecom, the second one was a networking business, and the third one is, is internet marketing software. So very different businesses. I actually didn't know much about any of the businesses that I started, including these three and the other 10 I probably explored. And the approach that I, I always took was I myself am going to be I'm going to mentally decide whether I'm in, in the investor mindset or in the entrepreneur mindset. And let me explain what I mean by that. During the time when I was evaluating 10 ideas, many of them were bad ideas, right? So in that fair period of time, I was like, I'm going to be the investor. Now, the investor finds all the problems. The investor doesn't say, you know, how, uh, the investor doesn't have to make a business work. The investor has to determine if they want to put money into this business. Well, I wasn't putting money in, but I was putting my time in. So I was going to look at every opportunity skeptically. I was going to say, all right, I'm thinking about doing X. What are all the problems? What are the market problems? What are the product problems? What are the team problems? What are the execution problems? What are the financial problems, right? I'm going to be deeply skeptical. And at some point, I would go through that, and many times I would decide this doesn't make sense. So I would, at, I would not, well, that wasn't when I was in a persistence frame of mind. That was when I was in an evaluation frame of mind. Once I made a call, once I said, okay, this is the one. Then there was no such thing as a bad idea anymore. Then it was just persistence 100%. I, I put aside the investor analyst in me. And then it was never, I never even asked myself the question, is this a bad idea anymore? I had chosen the idea, so I had to live with it, right? So now the, the only choice I, I had was to make this idea successful. And I just stopped asking that question. And, and I think that switch, it's very important to do the first because you do want to increase the probability that you're on to something significant and it works. And there are people who will be in analysis paralysis around that and never get on with it. So you do at some point have to say, you know what, I'm, never, I'm, in, I'm not, not totally there. I'm there enough. I'm, I'm in. And then you almost just tell yourself, I'm in. And then you switch, 
and you go, I'm no longer an investor, I'm now an entrepreneur, game on. Can you speak from a more technical perspective about the project you're currently working on, sure. what the product is, your sure. competitors are? Sure, absolutely, yeah. So um, our product is a set of APIs sure. that you can take any website or app and you make a real-time call back and it basically sends back a web page or sends back uh, an extent a JSON response, some kind of response mm -hmm. via API that then renders to a user. So you go in, you say, hey, you know, I know that you're, you're interested in gray, gray hoodies, so you come to the website, you're going to see a lot of gray hoodies. Sure. You know, and, and it's going to build a profile of the kind of things you might be interested in. It's going to know what kind of hoodies are, are selling you know, at that particular brand, and it's going to know what's trending broadly, you know, and it's going to take that universe of data it's going to index it. It's going to build a set of <laughs> algorithms on top that apply our machine learning techniques. And then it's going to spit back a response that then renders on your browser. And so we go work with large brands and large websites and large enterprises. They plug into our APIs, and we power you know, most of their, their experiences. And so the value proposition is, hey, plug in the consumer 